Well, brother, the title of this, this study is Why Are We Here? Now, I hope you find it interesting and you may find it challenging, but like myself, you've probably heard many sermons with that title. So why another one? Um, do we know why we're here? And do we really know why we are here? Now, there's a scripture that I really like, and it's in Ephesians 1 verse 17. Ephesians 1 17, this is Paul talking to the, to the brethren, and he, he says that, he, he prays that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, do we have the knowledge of what, what our um, incredible destiny really is? Well, in this study, I hope we can find out. So if we go back to what Paul was saying, this time to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, he says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, that expression, before the world, there's a, there's a number of places where you can read that there. But it says, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world which God promised before the world. Now, what was it God promised? Well, if you go to Titus 1 verse 2, Titus 1 2 tells us, in hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world. In hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world. So eternal life, was what was ordained and promised before the age even began, before the world began. And in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 2, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, Neither has entered into the, the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Man has neither seen nor heard these things. Man has not accepted these things because Satan has most of this world confused and deceived. So crying on verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 2. God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. 
yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But you have the mind of Christ. So, why another study about why are we here? Because apparently we don't know. We're still, we still ask, why are we here? And there's so many different opinions about that. We could spend a lot of time trying to decide why it is. But the answer in a nutshell, we are here to receive salvation. That's why we're here. But having said that, I feel um, there may be a slight misunderstanding about all this because, again, there are so many different opinions. Many believe salvation is being saved from something. So let's look at this for a while and let's see what the Bible says and what some of the early church believed. But for example, our denomination, our denomination says, Genesis tells us that the first humans did something that God warned them not to do. Their disobedience showed that they did not trust God and it was a violation of his trust in them. By being faithless, they had broken their relationship and fallen short of what God wanted for them. They were becoming less like God. The result, said God, was pain, struggle and death. If they were not going to follow the Maker's instructions, they were going to end up doing things the hard way. This is why he wants to rescue us, to save us, to restore the relationship he had with us. Salvation is a rescue operation. Salvation is reconciliation. God wants to give us eternal life, free from pain, to be on good terms with God and with each other. He wants our intelligence, creativity, and power to be used for good. He wants us to be like he is, to be even better than the first humans were. This is salvation. Well, that's what we say. Now, that may sound reasonable, but there's more. I feel that to say we will be like God is really limiting our potential. And it's even limiting God. Because in Genesis 3.22, Genesis 3.22, God says that we have already become like them. It also says that the man has become one of us. Now what does that mean, one of us? It must mean one of God, because it was God who is speaking here. The Oxford Dictionary states that salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences, believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Christ. Many Christian groups believe that, or something similar. Here's another one. The deliverance by the grace of God from eternal punishment for sin, which is granted to those who accept by faith God's condition of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Other groups say we must have good works and keep the law. And here's another one here. Um, what is salvation? It's a gift. It cannot be earned, yet we have been called to be his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Keeping the commandments and the laws of God are some of the good works Jesus told us we need to do. Okay. To many people, salvation means going to heaven. But you know, um, when you read about what all the different groups believe about salvation, I suppose when you get down to it, most of it sounds okay to a certain extent. But they all seem to stop short of seeing what the, the big picture really is. Um, 
Let's start with the belief of it going to heaven. When you were a child, well, when I was a child then, I remember the older people saying, when someone had died, they've gone to heaven and they're going to be an angel. They might even be a star. I'm sure you probably heard that yourself. Um, so, I, uh, I think that these are things that uh, adults told children. Um, you, know, you must understand, our destiny is far above being an angel. I mean, on, there's a program on the, the, the God channel, and it said that you can be a, something angel if you pay so much money. Now, no human being is ever going to become an angel. But I don't know. I think these were attempts for people to convince themselves that we humans are immortal. After all, Satan told Adam and Eve that they would not die. In other words, that they were immortal. But mankind has been dying ever since. Did all these people go to heaven and become angels? And then on the opposite side of the question, what about those who didn't go to heaven? They went to hell for eternity. Look, wherever they went after death, the point is they were believed to be still alive. And the wages of sin is death. Now, you know that the Bible is very clear in this. If you go to John 3, 13, John 3, 13 plainly says, No man has ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is now back in heaven. No dead human has ever gone to heaven. Those who died through all the ages are still in their graves. Their bodies have decayed and they've all returned to the dust. They don't know anything. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 tells us, Ecclesiastes 9 5, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, Ecclesiastes 12 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. Now, okay. When it says, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it, perhaps this is a, a reason why some people think they go to heaven when they die. But the Spirit that returned to God was not a living Spirit. Well, that's not strictly true either. <laughs> Um, the body died, it was placed in the dust of the earth, but the spirit went back to God. The spirit was, okay, you can say it was dead or it's not dead, but it was not active. It was not energized. And it will not be re-energized until the sound of the last trumpet at the resurrection when Christ returns. We are told that the dead know nothing and that even the memory of them is forgotten. If they did go to heaven and are there now with God, does that sound like they don't know anything and that the memory, they have no memory or there's no memory of them? But for, the, for them to be resurrected, from the dead at Christ's return. It means that if they're in heaven now, they have to return to earth before the last trumpet sounds. So they can die and be put in the grave, so they can be resurrected when Christ returns. Now what does that sound like to you? What about those who say works are required? So let's think about this. 
If a salvation requires good works from us, when well, nobody's going to be saved. We are saved by God's grace. It's a free, unconditional gift. Ephesians 2 verse 8 tells us, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The faith is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. That being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have been justified. That means we have been made righteous. Eternal life is now our hope. You'll have to excuse me, I'll have to take a drink. Sorry about that. The, the law couldn't bring us salvation. Keeping the law could not bring us salvation. What the law was meant to do was to let us see that we needed salvation. Hebrews 7 verse 19, Hebrews 7 19 says, The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near to God. This was planned from before the, the ages, from before the world was ever created. The law should have made us see that we needed a saviour. By seeing that, it brought in a better hope by which we draw near to God. In 1 Peter 1 verse 3, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you go back to Titus 3 verse 7, it tells us that that hope is eternal life. When Adam sinned, every one of us descended from Adam and heard of his sins. We have all sinned, and the Bible's clear. We have come short of the glory of God. And what does it mean, we've come short of the glory of God? Well, we didn't make it. That's it, we didn't make it. We didn't achieve what was offered, the glory of God. Isaiah 43, verse 7 tells us, Isaiah 43, 7, Even everyone that is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Now, does God mean that he created man for God's glory? Or does it mean that he created man to receive God's glory? Paul asks in Hebrews 2 verse 6, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Then he says in verse 7, You made him, that is man, you made him a little lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honour and did set him, that's man, you did set him over the works of your hands. Then he says in verse 8, you have put all things, you've put all things in subjection under his feet. That is man. Now compare that with what God told Adam in Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1.26 says, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them, man, have dominion over all the earth. But notice the next verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, now, 
he too was made a little lower than the angels. But in his case, it was for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. By God's grace, Christ died for every man. By God's grace, we don't have to die. By God's grace, we were saved. Romans 5 verse 2 tells us. Romans 5 2 tells us. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In other words, we rejoice in the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. But again, this isn't our faith that's doing this. Isaiah tells us that our faith is like filthy rags. No, this faith is the faith of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.22, Galatians 3.22 The scripture has concluded all that's us all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The faith of Jesus Christ grants us salvation. The promise is given to all who believe. It's not our faith. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. And it's God's gift. Ephesians 2 verse 8. I think we did read that. It says by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. This gift. This hope. Of the resurrection to eternal life. Is reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter 1 3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through Christ's faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time at the last time at the last trumpet what I'm trying to get you to see is that salvation is not just being saved from sin and its consequences salvation is our being saved to something it's being saved to eternal life it's God's will that man be saved. It's God's will that no man perish. And I know some find it hard to take in that everyone will eventually be saved. I know we, we can turn to scriptures that says that the, um, the wicked will be come ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. Now, the, there are others as well. But it says... It is God's will that all men be saved. Um, it also says in uh, 1 Timothy 2.6 that Christ gave himself a ransom for all. Not just some. He gave himself a ransom for all. God's will is that all men be saved. Those whom Christ ransomed himself for and this is not something that we have been asked, do we want? We're not being asked, do we want salvation? This is something that has already been done. Christ has done it. There's nothing we can do. It has already been achieved. Now, I know there's a... Um, God always gives us free choice. We are free to choose... But that's another study. Uh, I'm not going there today. But our salvation, our, sal our salvation, our hope is eternal life.
But brother, even that's not the end of it. God has granted us salvation, which not only makes us like God, there's only one God. It will also deify us to be members of the divine family. Over the past couple of years, there's been programs on TV, I'm sure you've seen this, um, claiming that Christ was married to Mary Magdalene. And that they had a family together. Now, I would seriously doubt if that was anywhere near correct. But God is a family. Look, in the Old Testament, um, God was married to, to Israel, whom he divorced because of Israel's continuous adultery with the, with the gods of the surrounding nations. But when Christ returns, he will marry him, or remarry him, the church. So we'll have the Father, and we'll have the Son, and we'll have the wife, which is the church, and they will all produce children of God. All will be a family. All will be the divine family, God. This is the good news Christ came preaching. This is the gospel, and the world does not know it. Christ said this world hates him. It killed him, and it killed most of the apostles. Yet God loves this world, and in his plan, he has already saved us. God is not asking us if we want salvation. The good news, the gospel is, you already have salvation through our Savior. So, why are we here? Now, I typed this into the computer, believe it or not. Uh, you should do it yourself. It'll help you see what our people think and believe about this. But what do you believe? That's the most important point. In Revelation 4, verse 11, Revelation 4, 11, it says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. That's speaking about us. Many websites quote that verse. They say we were created for God's pleasure. But is that why we were created? simply to give God pleasure. That's what it says. But some also add, so we can ultimately spend eternity in a place called heaven. But none of them seem to know or understand what they're going to do once they get to heaven. Now, there are a lot of similar or unvarying opinions and ideas about why we're here. We're not going to look at them. We're not going to look at them all. But I'll, I'll try and give you a, a wee bit of history here. Um, let's take the Westminster Catechism. Have you, have you heard of it? If you're Presbyterian, you probably would. <laughs> but anyway, this was written during the wars uh, of the, it's called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. It was actually a series of civil wars in England and Scotland and Ireland um, in the 1600s. Um, the Westminster um, Shorter Catechism, it was called, is a catechism that was written in 1646 by the Westminster Assembly. This was a synod of the English and Scottish theologians and laymen intended to bring the Church of England into greater conformity with the Church of Scotland, which was the Kirkus. Any good Presbyterian would know. The Church of Scotland was Presbyterian, which had a movement known as the Covenanters, and I'm sure you've heard of them. But the Covenanters were very important in the history of Scotland and of religion here in the British Isles. But eventually the Church of England became the established church in Britain and finally across 
the future British Empire, which took on a lot of people. The Covenanters got their name because they made a, a number of covenants, starting in the late 1500s, binding them to maintain their Presbyterian doctrines and sole form of religion in Scotland. A covenant was drawn up to oppose the, the efforts of the Catholic Church that was trying to recover its grip on Scotland at that time. But here in the mid 1600s, the Protestant leaders of the English Parliament were faced with a threat from Irish Catholic troops. They were going to come over and fight on the Royalist side in the Civil War. So they, they went to uh, the Scottish Covenanters to seek aid because the Covenanters had their own army. So, the, the, anyway, the Covenanters promised this aid on condition that the Scottish system of church government was adopted in England. Now, the Solemn League and Covenant was an agreement between these Scottish Covenanters and the leaders of the English Parliament. And um, the Church of Scotland accepted it, and then later uh, in the year, the, uh, the English uh, Parliament and Westminster Assembly accepted it also. But the Solemn League and Covenant was, was sent throughout the country, so every member of the population could sign it. This was in opposition to the, this, the Catholic fear. Anyway, uh, I'm a bit long-winded here, but anyway, <laughs> this was in effect a treaty between the English Parliament and Scotland for the pres preservation for the reformed religion in Scotland. And I hope I got a lot right there. I used to know all this stuff off the heart. But anyway, they got together and they made this the Westminster Catechism. And this catechism has been used, as I say, throughout the British Empire ever since. But the first question it asks, I suppose I could just have said that at the start. The first question it asks <laughs> is, what is the chief and highest end of man? And the answer is, the chief, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and to fully enjoy him forever. So, is that all that we are here for? And I do say that with the greatest respect. Many denominations cannot believe that we are destined to be in the family of God. For example, Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created now, who's this talking about? Who created? Well, if you go to John 1, verse 1. John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Nothing was made that was made. And that's he made it. So it was the Word who created all things. The Word who is called God, who later came to us as a human being called Jesus Christ. But notice there was someone with him. Someone also called God. And this is the one who no one has ever seen. And this is the one who is known to us as the Father. He is called God. And the Word is called God. How can that be? There can only be one God. The Shema, or the Shema, if you want. Deuteronomy 6, verse 2. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, that's a very serious statement. Especially for the Jews, and it should be to us as well. There cannot be two gods. Even the first, the first commandment says that them. Um, I am the Lord your God. Uh, 
which brought you out of the land of Egypt, you shall have no other gods before me. Um, now the context of John 1 verse 1 clearly and unmistakably states that there are, there are at least two individuals here. And let's go to Genesis 6 verse 4. Genesis 6 4 says, <coughs> When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Or Job 38 verse 7. Job 38 7. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. God is one. God is one family, consisting of more than one member. There is the Father, there are the sons, the chief one, if you like, is Jesus Christ. None of the other ones have anything to do with us. Only Jesus Christ is our God after the Father. The Father is our God, but Jesus Christ is our Savior and our mediator, our brother. There's only one God. Now, it's not my purpose here um, to show the female aspect of God. But it's, it is definitely there. And perhaps that could be a Bible study for us. But anyway, um, the point I'm making is that God is a family. Something tradition has made very difficult for people to believe. Why is it so difficult for people to believe that God is a family? Why is it so difficult for people to believe that we will finally become God in the family of God? The NIV in Colossians 2 verse 9, the NIV, Colossians 2 verse 9 tells us, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In Christ lives all the fullness, all the members of the, the deity of God. You have been given the fullness, membership of the deity of God, of the family. The Bible tells us we are and we will be children of God. Therefore, why can we not believe it? We cannot see God now in our present state. But when Christ returns and we are finally born again into that family, when we can see God as he is, how will we not be God? When Christ died as a human, he was resurrected. He was changed to glory. Christ is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn of many brethren. He tells us in John 17 verse 5. Well, he, asks, he asks in John 17 verse 5. Father, glorify you me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Christ has now received the glory he once had with the Father. We have all come short of that glory because of sin. But when we too are resurrected, born again from the dead, as Christ was born again, we also will receive that glory. We shall see him in all his glory. For we shall be like him. Now, I want to read something. And this comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Okay? This is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Article 3. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Question. Why did the Word become flesh? With the Nicene Creed, we answer by confessing. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. The Word became flesh for us in order 
to save us by reconciling us with God, who loved us and sent his Son to be the expi expiation for our sins. The Father has sent his Son as the Saviour of the world, and he was revealed to take away sins. Sick, our nature demanded to be healed. Fallen, to be raised up. Dead, to rise again. We had lost the possession of the good. It was necessary for it to be given back to us. Closed in the darkness, it was necessary to bring us to light. Captives, we awaited a, a saviour. Prisoners, help. Slaves, a liberator. All these things are, are these things minor or insignificant? Did they not move God to descend to human nature and visit it since humanity was in so miserable and unhappy a state? The Word became flesh so that thus we might know God's love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Word became flesh to be our model of holiness. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. On the mountain of the transfiguration, the Father commands, listen to him. Jesus is a model for the Beatitudes and the norm of the new law, love. Love one another as I have loved you. This love implies an effect of offering of oneself after his example. The word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. This is why the Word became man, and the Son of God became the Son of man, so that man, by entering into communion with the Word, and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a son of God. For the Son of God became man, that we might become God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in His divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. Now, I came to understand that years ago, but I certainly didn't expect to read it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This Catechism of the Catholic Church states that we are to become God. And this is something that most Protestant churches do not yet grasp. Now, but you know, this is also part of the dogma of the Greek Orthodox Church. And I want to read a couple of quotations from them as well. This one is from, uh, it's from a bishop in the, in the Orthodox Church. And he says that the aim of the Christian life which Seraphim described as the acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God, can equally well be defined in terms of deification. Basil, that's, you've heard of Saint Basil. Basil described man as a creature who has received the order to become a God. And Athanasius, as we know, said that God became man, that man might become God. Such according to the teaching of the Orthodox Church is the final goal at which every Christian must aim to become God, to attain theosis, deification or divinization. For orthodoxy, man's salvation means his deification. This is another one. Um, having, formed, having been formed in his likeness, in his image, man is called upon to acquire 
the in his likeness. In other words, deification. The creator, God by nature, calls man to become a God by grace. Now, we come to what the early church believed. Now, <laughs> I've got a few quotations here from them. I'm not going to read that now. Um, you know, a lot of people whenever they read about the, the church fathers and the early church fathers, a lot of people I think tend to be skeptical about what they have said. What they, I think they don't believe that they actually said these things. But anyway, it's their own choice, I suppose. But anyway, some of the early church fathers may actually have been taught by the apostles. This is how early we're going back here now. But they all seem to agree that the purpose of man was to become God. Now, whenever I, whenever I read all that there, I immediately thought of John chapter 6. Now, this isn't totally out of context here, but this is John chapter 6, verse 16. It says, On hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So this is a hard saying, and it's hard for people to accept. And tradition has made it virtually impossible for many people to accept. So why are we here? We're here to follow him. We're here to learn what good and what is good and what is evil, what is love. We're here to receive salvation, to learn what the evocation is. Salvation. We're here to grow and learn, to be ready to continue our growth in the family of God and on into eternity. This is a subject that I would say was, I would call it deep. Um, but I think it's something that you really should be studying to yourself. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope I've given you something to think about. And thanks for listening.